put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Tut Ank Amun and his wife, Anken Sen Amun, deserted the God who created the cosmos. But Moses, who also grew in a milieu of polytheism, stayed faithful to God. I hope you've enjoyed the recent visit to the treasures of Tut Ank Amun. He was only a little insignificant pharaoh compared to the others. Tutankhamun's mummy was found in the third coffin. If you have enough Egyptian pounds, you can visit his tomb in the Valley of the Kings and look at this coffin. Let me show you what they found when they opened the third coffin. The desk mask of the king. The Egyptians had weird ideas of what happens to a person when he or she dies. May I have your permission to exhibit his mummy? What a sad sight. The pharaoh looks quite pathetic without his gold trimmings. Let him rest in peace. I saw two royal thrones amongst the Tutankhamun treasures. This one portrays Egyptian polytheism. As I've mentioned, in the latter part of his life, he worshipped all the different Egyptian deities. But then in shocking religious contrast, you also see this monotheistic throne among his treasures. Here he is still called tut ank Aten, meaning in the living image of Aten. And his wife, daughter of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, is still called Ankensenpaten, before a name changed to Ankensen Amun. The relief shows their dependence upon the God of heaven and earth. Now, how did this throne get into his tomb? The motif proclaims the truth about the unseen, everlasting Creator God. Now, the Egyptians detested it, but it seems to me that truth, in this case, had the last word. Looking at Tutankhamun's statue at Karnak, I thought, he knew what was right, but for the sake of fame and wealth, he sacrificed his principles. So typical of human nature. And next to his statue, you see his wife's statue, Anken Sen Amun, the little girl who used to sit on her father's lap. So often we know what is right, but we do what is wrong. Have you discovered how weak we really are? We need God's help urgently to keep us faithful to him. Here the little Anken St. Barton sits on her mother's lap. Her parents taught her about the kindness of God. They encouraged her to love and obey him. When she grew older, she turned her back on truth. Has this happened to your child? Contact with the invisible creator God made Akhenaten and Nefertiti kind people. I've discovered through the years that the more I look to God, study about Him, the more I change for the better, I tend to become a little kinder. It is a law of life that by beholding we become changed. In contrast to the unfaithful behavior of their children, Tut Ank Amun and Anken Sen Amun, we have the faithfulness of Moses. The Bible says of him, that he also grew up in a polytheistic Egyptian milieu. And then he wrote something beautiful. Hebrews 11.25 He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. His eyes were not fixed on the dazzling allurements of the Egyptian court. No, he looked beyond the sensual pleasures of sin. Verse 27 says, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. May God help us, like Akhenaten, Nefertiti and Moses, to persevere in doing what is right and be kind to people. May help us daily to be a little kinder to one another. Let us focus our eyes more and more on the lovely Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us so much that he died for us. 
Moses died here on Mount Nebu. God honored him for choosing to follow him and gave him a special resurrection. You can read it in Luke. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming to change the living saints from mortal to immortal. He's going to resurrect those who died in him. May God help you and me to become humble and kind like Moses and Jesus. And one day, enjoy the future resurrection. May God help you to remain faithful to him. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. What is the greatest invitation that has ever been offered to mankind? The greatest invitation is the invitation to come to the supper, to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. How do I show through my action that I am willing to accept this great gift of salvation? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? John 2 verse 20. What did the Lord Jesus mean? Obviously he was referring to the temple of his body. And that in his death and in his resurrection he would show the power over death. But he spake of the temple of his body. John 2 21. Here we in the background are looking at the garden tomb in Jerusalem. The garden tomb shows all the criteria of the biblical story of the burial place of Jesus. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said, John 2, 22. The resurrection of Jesus is of paramount importance to Christianity. It is sad that some today even want to spiritualize that away. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins, and they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, 17, and 18. Of all the religions of the world, only Christ's tomb is empty because he is a risen Savior. He's the only one who had life within himself. He's the only one who can give life to whomsoever. He gives it because they choose to accept the free gift of salvation. This Jesus delivered up according to the Definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Acts 2, 23, 24, 32. We have to be witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are religious bodies in the world that say Jesus was not crucified. It only seemed as if he was crucified. If Christ be not risen, if Christ was not crucified, we are yet in our sins and our faith is meaningless. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What a promise! So the commission is to go out and to baptize people into this truth. Baptism is an important rite mentioned in the Bible. Baptism is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament. Surely, it must be of significance. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salim because there was much water there, John 3, 23. So baptism requires a fair amount of water. It is not a question of sprinkling or pouring a little bit of water over someone's head. John the Baptist was baptizing by immersion. 
Baptism, what does it mean? The Greek word baptizo means to dip, to immerse, to plunge underwater. So this is exactly what baptism is all about. Baptize means to put underwater. And that's why John the Baptist here at the Jordan River could baptize because there was much water there. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Matthew 3, 5 to 6. When we come to God, we confess our sins. We accept that we are guilty before God. We accept the free gift of salvation from our substitute, Jesus Christ, and to show that we are willing to die to self, we are buried in the waters of baptism and rise in Christ together with His resurrection as a new being. The old man of sin is dead. So baptism was a rite of immersion and it symbolized the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and my willingness to die to self and to be raised together with him. Let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this, said Jesus, as he went for baptism. He was not a sinner, but he showed us by his example the way we should go. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented, Matthew 3, 15, and he baptized him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, Matthew 3, 16, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. So Jesus went up out of the water, which means that he was immersed and was lifted up out of the water. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. This tells us that it was gentle, not with a roar. It was a gentle action. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts 10, 38. Jesus is our example. As we come up out of the waters of baptism, we will receive an anointing, a gentle anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we can go out and we can preach the gospel, which will set people free from their afflictions healing them of their spiritual maladies. If we inculcate the health reform message in our own lives, we can also assist in the physical upliftment of those around us. Jesus set us an example. He healed the sick and he healed the spiritual maladies of mankind, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples baptized. So Jesus has given this commission of baptism to his disciples. There's the interesting story of the Ethiopian eunuch in the Bible. And uh, when we read the Bible, we find some very interesting verses here. Philip was taken towards him at great speed. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and eunuch of great authority under the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip goes to him and says, Do you understand what you are reading? 
Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. This is a very important principle in the Bible. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. Acts 8, 30-32. This man was a devout Jew, because he came to the temple to worship. So he understood all the issues of obedience and the law, but he didn't know the Messiah. So he was wondering who this lamb was that was led to the slaughter. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop. Important question. And Philip said, Note the injunction, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the prerequisite to baptism is that we must believe with all our heart. Infants cannot believe with all their heart. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8.37. And so the fullness of the gospel, obedience to God's requirements, which he knew as a Jew, and acceptance of the Savior, who would be the mercy seat, shielding him from the condemnation of the law, came into one. And he was baptized into the whole truth and was sent forth like all other disciples to spread the gospel. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him, Acts 8, 36 to 38. So how was baptism performed in the early church? It was always performed by immersion. Here is an old baptistry. There's an old Byzantine cross that the lady is pointing to. And... The baptistry was a deep hole into which steps led to the bottom, and you climbed in and you were baptized by immersion. There is the shape of the baptistry. You climbed down the stairs and you were baptized by immersion. Here in the deserts of Judea, we find ancient baptistries, and again, they are for adults, baptism by emergence. Ancient churches reveal the methods of previous times, and if we go to some of the very old churches, there are the ancient baptistries. Here's a first century church in Philippians, and we can see that the baptistry was also large because they were baptized by immersion. If we go to Rome, however, the picture changes. In some areas, we still find large baptistries like here, but in general, the baptistries are now small and only a little bit of water is available for the pouring over an incense. Here's Cappadia, Tur Turkey, the hidden city of some Christians in the Middle Ages. And uh, hidden amongst these barren rocks, what do we find? A baptistry for baptism by Immersion. Here is an ancient church in Russia, and the baptism of the Russian king, Vladimir the Great, is depicted over here. Again, it is in a large baptistry, and it is a baptism that should be by immersion, although it seems as if there is some pouring going on in this tapestry. Here is a 4th century African fresco of Jesus' baptism, and we see that he's standing up to his chest in the water. So where does infant baptism come from? Why do we have it in the churches today? Why are babies who cannot decide for themselves, if you believe with your whole heart, you may? Where does this baptism come from? Well, infant baptism comes from the 6th century A.D. Janus was twice born. Holy water was used for baptism. It was made by plunging a torch from the altar 
into the water as the sun god plunged into the water and the womb. So this is an ancient Babylonian ritual. Today they will use a candle and plunge that into the water. The following curse was pronounced on the Roman Catholic Church defectors. May the Son who suffered for us curse him. May the Holy Spirit who suffered for us in baptism curse him. Let him be accursed who says adults must be baptized. History of Romanism, page 510. So it seems again as if this doctrine of infant baptism in Christianity can be traced right back to the Roman Catholic Church. For several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was conferred by immersion. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the Catholic Church, as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. This is an answer by James Cardinal Gibbons, The Faith of Our Father, 110th edition, page 277. Isn't this fascinating? So we get rid of the injunction of God because it is inconvenient. The Bible says that we have to be baptized. That means to plunge under. You have to hold your breath. You have to die or simulate death. You hold your breath under the water. And you are raised up into a new life with Jesus Christ. The, no the Bible knows nothing about infant baptism. And to argue that some passages where the whole family was baptized indicate that infants were baptized is not valid because the age of those baptized is never mentioned. All the clear texts in the Bible refer to adult baptism. And that's why mega churches like the Baptists, for example, accept this biblical injunction. John 3 verse 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And when we were in the womb, we were in the water. And when we were born, we took our first, first breath. When we are born again, we plunge into the water. We don't breathe, we come up, we take our first breath in the newness of life. It was not until the Council of Ravenna in 1311 AD that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. So we see this is 1,300 years after Christ. Only then did the pagan rituals start taking over. So we can trace them all back to Rome. Here we have the Roman God indicating the union between church and state. And this power enforced its doctrines upon the entire world. Here we have the most magnificent statues ever sculpted in the world, the Michelangelo's. Here is Moses, apparently, he threw his mallet at it and said, Get up, be alive! because it was so perfect. But the perfection and the beauty and the grandeur of all the cathedrals in the world cannot make up for the loss of doctrinal beliefs that are Bible-based. Why should we tolerate a change from a thus says the word to a thus says tradition? Yet millions around the world look for leadership in terms of doctrine to a faith based on tradition and not the word. And the baptistries have become smaller and smaller and smaller like this one in Rome. And infants are baptized and infused. The Bible says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4 verse 5. The Bible is very clear. Children are brought to the Lord to be blessed. So we take our young children, we take them to the Lord, and we ask Him to bless them. It is our duty as parents to guide the little feet of the children in the paths of righteousness until they can make their own decision. They are covered by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ until they are capable of deciding for themselves. 
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and I trust in His merits for salvation and I show that I believe this by allowing Him to give me a newness of life after I have been immersed in the waters of baptism. There is only one Lord, there is only one faith, and there is only one baptism, according to Ephesians 4.5. Isn't it fascinating that we have all these rites of baptism? Some believe you just sprinkle the water. Others believe you take a little bit of water and you pour the water. Others believe you have to be baptized by immersion. Some believe you have to be immersed three times in the name of the Father, the Spirit and uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Others believe you have to be emerged seven times. There are so many rituals out there. Why don't we just take the plain biblical injunction? The Bible says Jesus was baptized. He came up out of the water. It doesn't say he came up and went down and came up and went down and came up and went down. Take the biblical injunction. There is only one baptism, and that is adult baptism. So, what does it symbolize? We've already dealt with it, but let's just look at the biblical text. 1 Peter 3.21 And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also not by the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. So it's a promise that we make to God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no merit in the ritual. The thief on the cross, did he have a baptism? No. Is he saved? Yes. Because God recognizes the spiritual conversion that took place in his heart and he had no need for a physical baptism. But if it were possible for him to have actually undergone that ritual, would he have done so? Absolutely, because it is an injunction of God. It is a public expression of my personal decision in here. And so we are saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and is a symbol of the washing away of our sins and a rise in a newness of life. I tell you the truth, unless a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. The water symbolizes the regeneration. The Spirit empowers to do the work which God has chosen each individual to do. Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2 verse 37 and 38. This word repent is not a popular word today. But the Bible says repent. Turn around. Don't do what you did before. And then be baptized. Acts 2 38 to 39. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Now here is an interesting point. So when I am baptized, I also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, gently. So when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon us. We were separate from God. We are now back in line with God. As the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus and the Father said, this is my beloved Son, so the Father will say, this is my beloved child. And here we are, and he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. For what purpose? For myself? No. That is not according to the principle of love. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in order to further the gospel, to be empowered to preach the gospel of salvation. We will look into this issue 
of the gifts of the Spirit in our next session. It is important that we realize, as it says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, that to obey is better than sacrifice. In other words, we come back into obedience to God's requirements and the Spirit guides us to lead others to the paths of righteousness. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. So these marvelous gifts of the Spirit which we receive, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Romans 6, 4-6. God knows our condition better than anyone else. And each one of us receives a gift according to his talents, and God sends them out into their work. So some might be the mouth and speak, and others might be the hands that do behind the scenes. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him, Acts 5.32. So when we come back into this covenant relationship with God, we can go out and we can preach this gospel with power and we can witness as to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Romans 6 verse 3 and 4. Here is a fascinating principle. The Bible says that the fathers may not be put to death for the sins of the children and vice versa. Yet, Christ died for us. Isn't this a negation of that principle? Not if we take the full message. You see, conversion requires that we die to the old life. We die in Christ and we are raised together with him. So in a sense, we have to take the consequences of our action. We have to die to self and live a new life which only Christ, the author of life, can give us. Death to our old sinful way of life is essential in the Christian world. Today, people want to have a savior, but they don't want to give up the old world. So, they want salvation without obedience. The two cannot be separated from each other. Burial of our sins in the watery grave of baptism is essential. And the injunction, go and sin no more, is equally essential. So we have a resurrection to a new life in Christ. One where we walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5 17. In fact, they become so new that some of our own old acquaintances may not recognize us. Some of our old acquaintances may say, I want nothing further to do with you. You are not the same person. But when we do what is right, we receive a family that makes us part and parcel of the covenant relationship, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, says the Bible. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 11. Isn't it fascinating? The gospel is so plain, and yet these verses are so distorted that some preach today that we don't have to keep the law, we are under grace, we can do as we please, 
All we have to do is believe. No, the old man of sin must die. That is the fullness of the gospel. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the book of Galatians, talking about the law, is often so misunderstood. The laws that have been done away with are the ceremonial laws, but obedience is a requirement that will stand to the end of time. It was disobedience that caused the mayhem and the chaos. Surely it is logical that obedience will again be a prerequisite throughout the universe. So baptism commemorates Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Not Sunday, baptism. Secondly, it symbolizes the death and the burial of the old man of sin. The old man of sin is dead. It represents the resurrection to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Empowerment comes through the Holy Spirit. And it indicates the washing away of sin, Acts 22:16. This is the meaning of baptism. There is such a fullness in the ritual. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. But to believe means to believe everything and come into harmony with everything. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, Acts 8, 37. This is an adult ritual. Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent, turn around, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, verse 37 and 38. Now, did they obey? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, Acts 2, verse 41. So the church grew through baptism. So when we are baptized, it is not somewhere solitary that we are baptized for ourselves. We are baptized into the body of Christ. Today, millions of people seek baptism, but only few Seek baptism of repentance and a walking in the newness of life, leaving all the things behind that once separated. The baptismal rite is a beautiful rite. The white symbolizes the righteousness of Christ. And to be buried in the waters of baptism is every Christian's privilege. This young lady is determined to be baptized, even though it may be somewhat inconvenient. Notice the ice blocks floating in this wintry environment in Europe. You have to have a strong will to be baptized under those circumstances. So here are the steps to salvation. Number one, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Romans 3, 23. I believe with my whole heart and with my whole mind and with my whole soul. Number three, I confess I am a sinner, 1 John 1, 9, and I am in need of salvation. And I make a decision that I will follow Jesus the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Do we all need baptism? Yes, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is not one righteous, no, not one. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Acts 16.31 Fascinating. When salvation comes to a house, all are affected. Nobody can say, I am not involved in this. Either negatively or positively, but a decision must be made. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are all sinners. We all have to say we believe 
and we all have to confess our sins. Those are the steps we have to take, whether we want to or not. This is the biblical injunction. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me, Revelation 3.20. God does not force the issue. He will knock. But it is our job to open the door. So does baptism mean that I become part of Christ's church? They were added to them. All those thousands that were baptized when Peter preached that great message. So in the same way, baptism is not only a public display of repentance and resurrection in Christ. It is also baptism into his body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I cannot decide. I do not want to be part of the body. Can the hand say to the legs and to the trunk and to the head, I have no need of thee. I'm going to sit over there and do my own thing. No. We have to be baptized into the body. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2 verse 47. So they were added to the church. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And he is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1, 18. So there is no way of escape. I cannot say, I want to be saved, I want to be baptized, but I, I don't want anything to do with the church. And after all, they're probably all hypocrites. Well, we're all hypocrites. Welcome to the club. Is rebaptism called for? Some people claim we don't have to be baptized again. Well, in some cases, if you've had a genuine baptism according to the biblical principles, then that is accepted. But Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So here they received new light. And he said unto them, And what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Acts 19, 1 to 5. So they acted upon the new light and received baptism. God works through his church. So God has a body. The Bible doesn't say that body is perfect. In fact, it says it's anything but perfect. But God delights in using imperfection and imperfect people such as we are to go and spread his gospel. What a privilege. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? This is Paul's conversion. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Acts 9 verse 6. God does not circumvent his church when he called Paul. He said, Paul, go and it will be told. And what happened then? A disciple came and told him what the requirements of God work. So God works through his church. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightst receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 9.17 So I assume that Ananias baptized Paul because the gift of the Holy Spirit is conferred at the baptism. The leading of the Holy Spirit can take place before baptism and does. Every one of us is called by God. God knocks and the Holy Spirit leads. But the gift of the Spirit is conferred at baptism. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. If we are called back into obedience to God and walk in a way that is not the way of sin, then the body of Christ must be the one that keeps the commandments of God and holds to the testimony of Jesus. This is the body that preaches the three angels' messages. This is the body that Christ has called to bring the final message of hope to a world that is falling apart. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10 verse 16. As I have mentioned before, there are people in every denomination whom the Lord counts as his. And should they never hear the whole truth, God will judge them according to the knowledge that they had. Fortunately, all judgment has been given to the Son of God. And he knows the heart and the mind and he will make the decision. But that does not negate the fact that God has an organized body on this earth to whom he calls all into fellowship. And he will bring them. And if they hear his voice and they hear this message, and the Holy Spirit is in their heart and leading them and guiding them, they will follow. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. John 17, 20 to 21. Every single person who is baptized into Christ becomes a disciple. One is not more important than the other. There is no preeminence in God's church. So we do not have popes and prelates that decide for us what we must believe. The Bible is our standard of faith. But that doesn't negate the fact that the Lord has an organized body and that he has a structure which he has placed upon this earth. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. This is a prerequisite. We cannot accept anything willy-nilly. We have to accept the biblical truths, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, so that requires a complete Bible-based theology all the way through health reforms, through issues of salvation, Christian attitude, Christian dress, tr Christian decorum, reverence, all of these issues are important. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 17 to 20. None of these issues will disappear. Now some may say, you know, this is a bit much. <laughs> this is a hard teaching. Why should I accept all of this and my whole life be turned upside down? Is this really necessary? I'm not a bad person. Can't I just carry on the way I should? You know, John Wesley believed that too at one stage when he was a lukewarm Christian. He thought he was saved because he was not as bad as everyone else. He wasn't murdering, stealing, thieving, all of those issues. So he was all right, Jack. But that's not what salvation is about. Salvation is about a relationship, a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a hard teaching. Yes, it is. John 6, 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And they decided this is just too much. John 6 verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. We need not be disheartened when this happens. We are just sowers, sowing the seed, the growth the watering, God will take care of that. God will send others to water. But even then, some of the seeds fall on hard ground, some of them fall on fertile soil. And not everybody 
will accept the gospel. Some may reject it. I had a marvelous story. I was involved in an evangelistic campaign and there was this man who was violently opposed to his wife accepting this truth as it is in Jesus. And for 20 years he made her life a misery. And then he was converted. So we don't always know when they walk away, will they come back? Leave that to God. Preach the message, whether it is a hard teaching or not. John 6, 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? John 6, 68, Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There is no other way. This is the only way. I have no other choice. Many excuses will be found. Many things I do not yet understand. I'm not ready for this. Come back to me in 10 years time. Psalms 97, 11. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright of heart. We will be glad to receive light when we receive it. Psalms 112, verse 4. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. They will love this light. They will not turn from this light. Psalms 119, 130, the entrance of thy word give us light. If we love the light, we will be children of light. Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the righteous is like the first glimpse of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Do you think we'll ever get there? I don't think so. I think we will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And we will continue growing for all eternity to make an excuse that I don't know everything yet so that I need not be baptized is no excuse at all. If I understand the principles and I know what is required, even if I haven't perfected it yet, I can come into the waters of baptism and ask God to lead me and guide me. None of the priests and the rulers believed. Why don't all the other churches teach this? Why should I do this complicated thing. John 7, 32, the chief priest sent officers to arrest him, Jesus. Verse 46, 47, they came back and they didn't arrest him. Why? No one ever spoke like this man. You mean he has deceived you also, they said? Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Do we have to have all the high officials of the churches to believe these things in order to follow? The Bible says so. Do it. Some may say the price is too high. I don't want to do this. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not my will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. So here is our choice. Is it going to be our will or is it going to be the Lord's will? I'll wait till the Spirit moves me. That's a very common excuse. I'm not ready for this. I'll wait till the Spirit tells me. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. Proverbs 16, 25. If you put it off, you might put it off forever. I don't want to do this. This will cause division in my family. Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 34 to 37. I cannot use it as an excuse. And he that does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 38. Yes, it will cause opposition. But that opposition will strengthen and eventually we will become stronger and stronger and stronger and less and less ashamed. When I became a Christian, I was so ashamed of saying, I no longer believe in evolution. I don't, I kept trying to keep it to myself and then I realized I'm a coward. Tell people what you believe. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Isaiah 43 verse 1, this is a promise. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Psalms 95 verse 7. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. Luke 19, 19. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. It's no excuse to say I'm not ready yet. We need to paint the blood of Christ onto the doorposts of our hearts. And then he asks, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. May the Lord give us strength to do what is right and to leave the consequences to him. And whatever happens, he will empower us to do the right thing and to stay faithful until he comes. Amen.